Council, I'd like to uh, call, call the meeting to order and thank everyone for their attendance. Uh, we've got a lot to do today, but before we get started, a couple, uh, I'll be brief, but I think it is important. Um, I want you to know that I did send a letter to the mayor of Charlottesville, and I will read that in our formal session. I don't believe I need to read it now, um, just expressing our uh, sympathy, our support for them, and I'll read that in the formal session. But also, I think before we start the meeting, if we could just have a moment of silence to uh, think about the victims and that awful weekend, please. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, we'll go ahead and get started, and we'll begin with the transit planning. And Brian, you're up there already, so I'm assuming you're in charge. Let's go. All righty. Yes, sir. Thank you for having Mr. Mayor, members of council. Uh, I'd like to um, welcome Ray Maruso, the uh, Chief Plan Development Officer for Hampton Roads Transit, who's going to uh, partner with me in this briefing. And um, we have a lot to go over, so I'll try to be um, compact with this briefing and leave some time for um, questions and any discussion you'd like to have. So we have been busy for the last six to eight months, and this is kind of a brief timeline of where we've been. Uh, coming away, uh, frankly, from the November referendum, we re-engaged formally in the conversation with City Council on uh, January 17th about where we go from here. Um, and if I remember right, during the Council discussion, um, there were some uh, suggestions that uh, staff had an opportunity to, to put their plan together. Why don't we listen to the public first and uh, develop a plan from there? And so um, that is what we did, starting with uh, within a two-week, um, three-week period or so. Uh, had our first workshop, our first multimedia workshop, where uh, not only were we live here at City Council Chambers, but we also uh, were on VBTV. We also were on Facebook Live and uh, Twitter, so fully on social media, engaged at the same time. And then the briefing and the discussion lived online after that. And um, we had um, over 560 responses to a survey that, that um, we conducted during that time. Um, in order to be uh, show a balanced approach to transit planning, uh, Public Works also did kind of a, a briefing on backlog roadway needs over a billion dollars worth. And so um, we had that part as well. We followed that up in your city council packets prior to your two-day uh, retreat on February 13th and 14th with all of the feedback we received um, during that um, open period of the survey and during the public meeting itself. And then throughout several council meetings in um, late winter, early March, uh, there was discussion about we need to continue on with this com conversation um, and, and community engagement. So we had our second uh, meeting on March 22nd at the Sandler Center. That too was multimedia and uh, included social media as well. And um, we had uh, a good bit of uh, public engagement with that as well. And I'm gonna tell you kind of summarize in three or four bullets what the general feedback was. Um, also coming out of your um, city council uh, retreat in February, it uh, became a priority by council, um, and I'll talk about the priority related to improving transportation, to come up with an autonomous uh, vehicle plan, and I'll touch on that in this briefing as well. Uh, in April, we came to you uh, for discussion on uh, budgetary uh, reasons regarding uh, transit services and uh, the true up from FY16, and um, starting in spring, Hampton Roads Transit started their public engagement for their transit development plan, and that's going to be the second half of this briefing that Ray is going to go over. Um, on April 14th, we provided you uh, some more feedback from that second public meeting uh, for March 22nd and the survey from that. And uh, we've also been busy working with the market. Uh, Megabus had uh, chose to establish a presence here in Virginia Beach, uh, coming to and from um, the resort area, and I'll give you kind of an update on where they are since they've been operating since uh, the first week of June. And again, over the, the entire spring, um, HRT, and, and Ray's really going to go into some detail about this, has been um, performing their transit development plan, technical analysis, and um, going over the feedback they got from their uh, 200 um, or so focus group members. 
We also, um, based on council direction from last fiscal year, established the new Bayfront to Oceanfront uh, shuttle, and um, that began uh, May 22nd. We'll give you an update on that as well. Um, we have uh, Mercedes Holland here, um, that she is the community plan liaison from Little Creek um, Fort Story uh, Joint Expeditionary Base. And I'll give you kind of um, an overview of a uh, shuttle we're trying to establish for security reasons from the, um, the main gate there to and from the Cape Henry landmarks. Um, we're also making some no cost or low cost service changes. Uh, one in particular that um, we've been, um, that's gonna come into effect in early October is providing uh, service directly onto the Centera Princess Anne uh, campus. And uh, we've also been working with the Lynn Haven Mall administration on better service uh, to them as well. And then um, the robust capital program that you funded uh, to improve the 508 or so bus stops in um, Virginia Beach. We kind of give you an update on, on where uh, your dollars are being spent and how, uh, what the status of that is. So you established 10 goals uh, during your uh, retreat. And uh, goal number three was related to improving the transportation system. So the briefing is going to, the framework for that is going to be surrounded around these objectives from, from that improve your transportation system goal. Um, in terms of an overview, these are the init city initiatives that I'm going to touch on in the, in the coming slides. And then again, uh, Ray's going to go over the uh, transit development plan from a regional perspective and what Virginia Beach's part is in that. Um, community engagement, um, went over with you that it was through January and March. Um, and those four, four bullets on the right is basically what the public told us from a transit um, transit ridership pers uh, perspective. And we have some of the region's um, transit ridership advisory committee members here, uh, the ones that represent Virginia Beach, Mr. Joe Belloc and Deborah Ward are here that represent Virginia Beach for uh, the citizen group for HRT. Shorten our ride, you know, uh, commuting to and from work in particular um, needs to um, happen in, in, in a more frequent and the second one more dependable way. Um, and we'll, we'll tell you what our recommendation is for that. Make ride, uh, riding transit simpler. In terms of using technology right now, you have to have exact change to um, get on uh, transit, and um, especially the bus. And um, with technology today, there's a lot more efficient ways of, of doing that. And one of the top things that we heard, both through our public engagement piece, as well as Parks and Recreation's Bikeways and Trails uh, plan update, and, and Mr. Michael Calvert, your Parks and Recreation Director is here, and Wayne Wilcox, your uh, Bikeways and Trails Planner is here. Um, they've been hearing it, the same thing, that it's a top priority. And um, I have in my office, I think, a 1981 um, bike plan, and I think Ms. Henley was the main person on council, and it, it was on the corridor plan then. So it's been around for about 35, 36 years, that concept of doing that. Um, as far as an update on your uh, bus stop accessibility and, uh, and uh, shelter project, coming out of the gate here later on this month, we have a great project manager um, under Phil Pullen's side of the house from Public Works where we're surveying each site, we're um, engineering each site, making sure it meets stormwater requirements, and those are the locations just from a high view of things that 13 new um, shelters will go on and two new benches. Um, as well. We also did a lot of accessibility improvements that your mayor's committee for persons with disabilities uh, recommended. They inspected uh, many shelters and had recommendations for improving the accessibility to them. So we used some of the funding for that. And we also used some of the funding to provide accessibility improvements at the new Bayfront and Oceanfront shuttle stops. Am I correct to understand you've got one at, going in at Beach General and one at Princess Anne? So, um, yes, sir. And thank you, Mr. Mayor, for, um, for liaisoning with the Virginia Beach General Hospital, and we are we did add that one okay. um, to the uh, to the list. Uh, so that's the one way up there, Centera General. There, so yes, sir. Mm -hmm. And then for Centera Princess Anne, we looked at it, and they're going to go straight into the, the bus loop at the main entrance, so they don't need a shelter there because okay. it's covered. Um, but we are for Centera General on both sides of the road there. Great, thank you. So, so in terms of the Bayfront shuttle, uh, it's a it was a pilot program. But we believe there's enough ridership there to continue it on to a second year. Uh, we believe with uh, the Lesnar Bridge project winding down that uh, going on to the west side of the Shore Drive corridor will increase ridership. We believe we need to go from a 45-minute uh, frequency, which is kind of a, uh, an odd time frame, to a 30-minute uh, time frame. 
And um, also some of the positive feedback we received was uh, this is a great service, but can we uh, have some training in the community on, on how to use transit for those folks that hadn't used transit much before in the past? So we'll, we're looking to engage in that next year, but I don't want to offer this to you until we have costs associated with it. So as, as your um, next budget season uh, winds up, we will uh, come and revisit you with the costs associated with that. So um, the shuttle I was referring to, there's been a good bit of conversation at the um, executive level with uh, Mr. Hansen and, um, and uh, Captain Franson and his um, EXO about uh, employing better security at uh, Fort Story, in particular the main gate, and a plan that's being developed with Preservation Virginia and the city and uh, the military is to pull the... Um, Gate back uh, slightly right and have the um, grab this track. Gotcha. And, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, have the parking lot fully outside of the um, of the gate itself, and then uh, take a multi-person shuttle, 12, 15 passenger uh, shuttle to and from um, the the main landmarks that are about a mile and a half uh, from there and back. And we're working out the details. Uh, there's an option for. Uh, Preservation Virginia, who actually owns the real estate and the landmarks themselves, uh, to contract out for that service like they do at Naval Station Norfolk that occurs today. Um, if you can have a cost-effective uh, approach to that, that might be a, a good approach. If not, we may be looking at um, purchasing you know, two vans and maybe helping with the maintenance of that. Um, but you know, we're working through the city manager on, on that uh, because of the new security um, um, requirements that are coming in. Right now, folks can once they're um, checked uh, at the gate and it's random checks, um, really they can take the vehicle anywhere on the base. And um, you don't have really a good points of control uh, that way. So that's something we've been working on and, and we'll continue to, to work through. Um, Megabus, again, it's passenger bus service, uh, came to Virginia Beach uh, June 5th. Um, you approved it uh, back in April. Um, it's currently at the dome site, the former dome site right now, the wayside off of uh, Princess Anne, I mean off of um, uh, Pacific Avenue. And uh, ridership in the first two months, uh, you've got about 100 more folks coming to Virginia Beach than leaving, about uh, 1,000 folks that have um, used the service, and about 900 that um, have used it uh, leaving here. Um, Richmond is a point of major transfer, so they have 11 bus lines there. You can either go to the southeast corridor um, down through uh, Raleigh, Durham, Charlotte, Atlanta, uh, from there, or you can take the Northeast Corridor to Union Station at Washington, D.C., Baltimore, and Philadelphia, and other points um, from there. And wide, on any given day, you have a wide range of folks there that are using um, that service. So um, those kind of, I call them just do it uh, type of decisions were uh, low or no cost ones, and one of them is where the uh, Santerra Princess Anne Hospital staff approached um, the city and said we'd like to have more direct um, service um, to the hospital, and HRT met with, uh, met with uh, us out there to try to uh, determine what the best way was to do that. Well, Santerra's roads are private, and I remember during the planning of that uh, project that uh, there was a conscious decision for them to be private. So they have given express permission to HRT legally to uh, operate their buses on that route. So that has kind of been taken care of uh, just as of this week. And that service will start October 9th. So it will start mid-year at no additional costs um, because of some other route-related changes. Uh, we've been working with the Lynn Haven um, Mall administration. I want to thank uh, Council Lady Kane for liaison, uh, being the liaison with um, the general manager there. And... Um, it's one of the recommendations that, that Ray's going to um, go over would really provide um, what we call high-frequency service to the Lynn Haven Parkway corridor. Another initiative that we're working on in advance of the uh, former dome site being redeveloped is a, an oceanfront transportation or transit center. All of these uses that have the check marks next to them, HRT year-round routes, actually max routes as well, the ones that are commuter routes, the seasonal shuttles, um, Amtrak has a coach bus that goes to the Newport News uh, rail station, and there's also uh, commercial providers, like uh, there's a taxi stand there as well. They're all in various spots in the 19th to 20th Street corridor. And with the redevelopment of the dome site pending, we're trying to get out ahead of that and develop a plan and, uh, and a concept to be able to leverage limited city funding to, to go for grants to um, accomplish that. 
That's the downtown Norfolk Transit Center um, across from MacArthur Mall. We are looking at something that's a fraction of that size. We don't have nearly the number of bus routes that, that they do down there, but we do believe that um, some type of modest improvements are needed to consolidate those uses. So uh, about the shared use path, we believe it's time to kind of turn the corner in terms of uh, being intentional about planning um, the next you know, the next evolution of, of that corridor, and that starts with maybe uh, better bicycle and pedestrian connectivity. Um, again, it's been a top priority um, of your bikeways and trails plan, and from a broader uh, perspective, this will be part of the Southampton Roads Trail. We do believe we need to develop a lower cost approach. Maybe we do not have the uh, above grade crossings of major arterials uh, in them. We do need to work with HRT and the Federal Transit Administration, uh, who still has a 12.5% interest in the right of way, uh, to get permission to remove the infrastructure. That will also help parks and recreation with maintenance, um, all the steel and, and other infrastructures in the middle of the right of way. It's difficult to maintain. We also need to work with our franchise utilities uh, and major utilities that are in there to make sure that um, uh, we're coordinated, uh, everything happens in a coordinated fashion. So when I say a low-cost approach, we'd like to leverage limited um, existing capital dollars and, and go for grants like we have for the Thayer Creek Greenway and, and build it in segments. And in doing so, in terms of transit and, and in the context for transit, you do get good connectivity to and from major bus stops, your major corridors of Witch Duck Road, Independence Boulevard, Lynn Haven Parkway, um, First Colonial Road, and, um, and, and Birdneck Road. So... You have a small segment that's been built on along Norfolk Avenue, and we'd like to build other segments along the way. Uh, with your permission, we'd like to uh, start with a kind of conceptual design and, and a different cost approach to accomplishing that. So uh, autonomous vehicles, uh, you, you're seeing a lot of um, uh, talk across the country from the federal level, state level, and local level <clears throat> about what different uh, pilot programs are going on to uh, advance uh, autonomous vehicles and connected vehicles and, and what's called vehicle-to-vehicle -vehicle, uh, communication and v uh, VT2I, uh, which is vehicle-to-infrastructure communication. <laughs> the good news is we have a lot of that infrastructure in place. Public Works has, and uh, Information Technology have done a great job under Mr. Hansen's leadership of, of getting that in the corridors um, and at the intersections. In the intersection um, boxes, that's where the kind of the two-way radio uh, technology can be placed to communicate to and from vehicles. But we believe we need to establish a plan before we get into implementation. We need to identify resources, and everybody needs to know what their role is in uh, implementing a smart cities plan because it's not just about transportation. It's other modes of connectivity, including technology, um, public safety. So there's going to be a lot of folks at the table uh, in developing this plan, and we can roll out components of it like an autonomous vehicle um, component, for example. And uh, we'd like to get started with that um, in fulfillment of that part of your transportation goal. So with that, I'd like to transition to Ray, and, and this is uh, where he's going to go over the regional transit uh, development plan, and we'll stand by for any questions you might have. Thank you very much, Brian. Ray, we're glad to have you. Thank you, Mayor Sessoms, and good afternoon, members of the council. Um, I'm here to follow up with Brian's discussion. Uh, of course, HRT being a regional service provider, the development of the Regional Transit Development Plan addresses more than just transit in Virginia Beach, but we'll talk a little bit about the focus of service in Virginia Beach looking down the road. It's a 10-year plan, and there's different elements in the plan that talk about high-frequency service, uh, service planning decisions that are drafted uh, or focused on um, data as much as other needs, uh, and the bus fleet capital needs and a state of good repair. I'll cover all of that in the discussion. So what is the Regional Transit Development Plan? It's essentially a requirement by the state. Virginia Department of Rail and Public Transportation requires um, that the, each transit agency in the state prepare a 10-year uh, plan uh, for service and capital needs that basically functions as a blueprint. It will identify uh, how you anticipate growth in transit services over that 10-year period, what would the associated operating costs be over that 10-year period, what are the capital needs, and what are your plans for maintaining a state of good repair? It's simply a, blue pl a blueprint, but one that actively involves the public, uh, individual stakeholders, members of the Transit Advi uh, Riders Advisory Committee, and uh, elected officials like yourselves. Uh, it guides service planning on a yearly basis over that 10-year period. As we begin every discussion every year for the next fiscal year for budget, uh, we would take out some of the recommendations that are adopted and bring it forward to each of the cities that help fund services and talk about 
the suggestions and what the associated costs would be. Uh, the goal uh, really in the TDP was to be a collaborative process with members of the public. This has been ongoing since the early spring and will continue this fall. We're about halfway through the development of the Regional Transit Development Plan. Uh, we intend to bring it in front of the Commission, the Transportation District Commission of Hampton Roads, in December for adoption because we're required to submit it to the Virginia Department of Rail and Public Transportation by January. Uh, but we collect data through a series of small focus groups with various stakeholders, both businesses, existing riders, potential riders, and other key stakeholders. And then that helps frame the service needs and definitions of shortfalls. As a reminder, I thought I'd put up here, uh, we're very happy and thankful that the city of Virginia Beach participates in funding part of our service in this region. You fund, uh, you provide funding either entirely or in part with partners from Chesapeake and Norfolk uh, service for uh, the routes that I have listed here. Um, I highlighted three, of course, the uh, Route 30, 31, and 35 are funded a little bit differently than out of the city's budget. Um, but uh, overall, you provide funding for all this. And then the MAC services, those express services that come from key park and ride areas to key destinations uh, like military installations are funded by a commission level funding that's established through the cost allocation agreement. So it doesn't come directly from any one city, but rather it's taken off the top by contributions. Service planning concepts was in, within the transit development plan are going to look at and what we've been looking at is looking at the productivity of existing routes. How productive are they? And we, our currency that we measure productivity is simply ridership. How many trips do we generate for a revenue hour of service? Look, we're going to be looking at adjusting the service hours of existing routes that they need to. Do you need a few more hours to run later? Or perhaps you're running too late and need to adjust it back depending on ridership demands. Realigning existing routes. There are routes in our system that date back before the merger, before 1999, that had a reason. Um, a lot of people, not so much in this city, but in the older cities of Norfolk and Portsmouth, that had a reason that they exist, but perhaps some of them no longer exist. No one can recall why they're going where they go, but we're looking very closely at deviations when they come off of primary arterials. Incorporating new routes. This region and this city in particular is growing. Places from 1999 that didn't exist in this city that have large population and employment now, are we serving them? That's part of what we're looking at. We're changing the length of a route and how far down that route will go to. And also route eliminations for those who perhaps are not performing as well as they should be. And then the final element, and I'll talk a little bit about that, is establishing a high-frequency transit network. So this is a map that depicts the Southside Service District, and you'll see on it not only the city of Virginia Beach, but of course Chesapeake and Portsmouth and Norfolk. There's a complementary map on the north side that shows the cities of Newport News and Hampton. Um, but you can see there's a proposal for a system of routes for a high-frequency service that Virginia Beach would have in its city, some unchanged routes, and some updated alignments. And I'll move through them in another map in a moment. But um, the concept discussion for high-frequency transit service. As Brian had pointed out in his focus groups back in April, in our focus groups, and, and even earlier than April and February, in our focus groups, the one thing that existing customers and, and people who would consider using transit but don't today ask for more than anything else is better frequency. Why, why is so much of our service, and we have 71 routes in the system, either hourly or 30-minute service, I'd like to see better service frequency. So. We took a look at our top performing routes based on the data and uh, moving forward and what they're serving and came up with a core 20 network that would be laid on top of the existing local bus service that would run 15-minute service frequencies, primarily oriented to the major employment sites of military bases, medical and hospital establishment, two- and four-year universities, hospitality and hotel, and provide exactly what people uh, have asked for. The second most requested thing that they've asked for in these focus groups is state-of-the-art technology. I know many of you have heard from your citizens that move around the country and come back and talk about the, the wonders of taking a phone out and looking at it and knowing what time the next bus is coming at a bus stop, or maybe even paying with a mobile fare payment or reloading your phone to have mobile fare payments. These are all things that we hear from our own customers. Uh, it only requires the uh, capital investment for that. We know that that's something that's very important to attract not only, uh, to retain not only our existing customers, but to attract um, choice riders, people that perhaps would use transit. It was just a bit more convenience. The other thing we've heard a lot of is to make it seamless. 
If I'm on a 15-minute route, I'd like to connect to another 15-minute service frequency. I don't want to wait 60 minutes for a bus to arrive. And then uh, finally, give us better passenger amenities. And Brian talked a little bit about that as well. We have 2,800 bus stops in the entire six city areas. 507 of them are in the city of Virginia Beach. Right now, Virginia Beach only has 27 that have covered protected areas, shelters. Um, again, the only thing that's been limiting us to providing more of that is capital funding. So this plan will address a plan for uh, making um, more investments in passenger amenities to provide a protected environment. So we looked at transit propensities. Where are the concentrations of, concentrations of people who work or where are they living and what drives the connectivity? And you can see the travel flows on the right today and moving in the future. And you can see quite the network of travel desire lines in the city of Virginia Beach. Uh, no surprise to a lot of you, you can see the east-west movement, the movement down Princess Anne Carter, the movement out to the oceanfront, the movement up to Shore Drive. Uh, a lot of it oriented to the major employment, retail, and medical centers in the city. Um, this helps us map where the desire lines are and where they will be in the future. It also, we use a, a service gap analysis. This city in particular is changing. Uh, where are we not serving geographic areas within the city? And there are geographic gaps in the city today. Or where are we serving with minimal service of hourly service? And the colors represent those different areas. And we began to identify the need for additional service based on uh, the propensity of people who say they would use a system. What we look for in terms of key service performance indicators is focused on the three blue boxes. <laughs> service effectiveness, cost efficiency, and service quality. And by effectiveness, how many passengers can we generate per revenue hour of service? Because an hour of service at four buses an hour is a costly thing. Um, passengers per one-way trip. The more passengers you generate on a trip, the more fare box revenue you collect and therefore your fare box return or recovery helps uh, lessen the need for subsidy between the federal, state, and city subsidies. So subsidies per passenger boarding is one of the key elements we look for. And then on-time performance is linked to reliability. The reason there are so many complaints in our system is our bus system today is old. The average age of our 291 buses is 10 and a half years. That's very old. The federal standards say we should be at six and a half years. It's not for want of trying to get the average age down, but it's a lack of capital dollars. As you all know, we don't have a dedicated funding source. We rely on cons uh, discretionary dollars from Congress and grant opportunities. While we should be replacing buses at a clip of 25 to 30 a year, up until recently it's been four or five buses a year. So that's why our bus fleet is getting older. So uh, the high-frequency transit network concept is really focused on more dependable, frequent on-time service. It doesn't matter where you are in the service district, whether you're a resident of Virginia Beach or a resident of Chesapeake or Norfolk or even on, on, in Newport News, it'll be the same service span of the day and the week. Uh, you won't have to guess if I'm standing in Chesapeake and I get home because Chesapeake is currently only funding service till 7 p.m., but I work in Norfolk on the second shift at or third shift at Sentara Hospital, and I don't get out of that ship till 11 o'clock. I choose to take public transportation, but I can't get home. So with a high-frequency transit network, that guesswork is out because the characteristics of that network is um, related to providing, uh, the, uh, eliminating the lack of get, uh, the uh, guesswork out of using the system. So with the high-frequency transit network, we calculated that 73% increase in the service district, and this is not just the city of Virginia Beach, but the entire service district, would be uh, served by hot, those core 20 networks. With a 190% increase in the overall population, that would be within a quarter mile, that's the acceptable walk distance, of a high frequency route. With an increase of 90%, uh, more jobs would be within access of a quarter mile, that high frequency transit network. Uh, the characteristics of the network is during the peak periods, Monday through Friday, from approximately 6 a.m. to 9 a.m., and then again, 3.30 to 6.30, you would see 15-minute service frequencies. That means if you're at a bus stop and you're waiting for a bus, every 15 minutes a bus would come by. During the middle of the day and the early evening hours, it would be 30 minutes uh, service, which is two buses an hour, and then late evening and very early morning hourly service with consistent service on Saturdays and Sunday, which is very sporadic and irregular in the six cities today. So um, this map is the map I had before to kind of highlight for the council members 
um, where the uh, investments um, are going to be made on the high frequency network. We've shown the uh, diverse connections of the high frequency network going to key areas, but a couple of rats I want to highlight. Uh, that just popped up. It's a new rat that doesn't exist today, that shaded blue area. They would emanate out of uh, Pembroke or the town center area and run down uh, Kemp's, uh, Witch Duck Road and Kempsville Road all the way out to Greenbrier Mall. This is one of those geographic gaps in the city today uh, that has no transit service in that direction. Yet when we looked at the data, there has been a lot of growth in this area. Um, it's a, most, some of it is in Councilman Dyer's district. Um, a lot of uh, retail and residential growth. Um, there's a propensity, if you recall, when we were looking at light rail for the town center, we were proposing this very same route to emanate out of the Witch Duck Station because there's a great need to serve this area, and there's a great number of people from our origin and destination survey that work in the Greenbrier area that uh, live in Virginia Beach. The second one I want to highlight in the high-frequency network, if I can get it to come up, there it is, um, is uh, you can see the adjustment in kind of a pink color and a yellow color. Uh, the Route 1 today is very long, comes out of Norfolk, goes to Pleasure House Road, comes down Independence Road and all the way to Pembroke. It has a lot of reliability and uh, on-time performance issues because of the length of that route and the traffic congestion. We're proposing extending the Route 36 up to Pleasure House Road and truncating the Route 1 so that it ends at Pleasure House Road. The Route 36 has extra time and it's scheduled to do that, is a strong performer in this city and can serve Independence Boulevard better than the Route 1. There's an adjustment you can see in a kind of a pale yellow color. That is an uh, adjustment in an existing route, the 26, that would uh, go up Rosemont Road and then turn left on Bonnie Road and serve all the new growth area at the Convergence Center and then go through Constitution to the Town Center. But everything along Bonnie Road is not served today by any fixed route service. It would, there's no route on Rosemont Road as well, and there's a great propensity that we see in the data for service in that area. And then finally, this other blue color on that dark blue line is a brand new route. It doesn't exist today. Again, another geographic area that's not served very well. It's only able to happen because of the completion of Lynn Haven Parkway. But bringing a route that emanates out of uh, Arctic and 19th at the oceanfront, going uh, to Lynn Haven Mall, serving Lynn Haven Mall, as Brian had discussed, but then connecting to the TCC campus as well as the hospital, and then moving along Lynn Haven Parkway all the way out to the Greenbrier Mall a brand new connection for a lot of residential areas that don't have service today. So with that, I'm going to bring Brian back, who's going to talk about the next steps of where we go from here. Thank you, Ray. Brian, welcome back. Yes, sir. And you've been very generous for your time. A lot of good people waiting to talk to you, so we're going to wrap things up here uh, with some next steps that we're heading in. This transit development plan is only as good as the costs um, related to it in terms of um, the balance we need to strike in coming back to you. Um, if you recall, during the light rail extension project, we were doubling bus service, and a lot of feedback we received was, why don't you just double bus service without that particular capital investment? Well, it wasn't that easy. We had to revamp some lines in terms of connectivity and also listen to the public and, and re-looking at that, and that's what we've done, and that's what we brought before you, but the next step is to come back to you as part of the budget process with the associated costs. The key, though, with the high-frequency transit network that, that Ray was talking about is that we are looking, frankly, for the Commonwealth to help us fund that. And so for all of the, at least the six cities that participate in Hampton Roads Transit, uh, the commission there, um, they would need to consistently um, work on their legislative agenda um, on that ask uh, with the Commonwealth. We'd like to move forward and um, with, a, with a very broad and comprehensive uh, smart cities strategic planning group and really develop a, a robust plan and um, identify resources to implement the autonomous vehicle piece. We'd like to pursue grants in partnership with uh, Parks and Recreation and Public Works uh, to start to build segments of the east-west um, pathway along the former Norfolk Southern right-of-way, and we'll need to coordinate with Hampton Roads Transit and the FTA in doing that. We'd like to continue discussions and, and advance the conversations with the, uh, the shuttle um, and what that means in terms of resources for Virginia Beach and with that shuttle with the Cape Henry landmarks. And again, we will come back to you when we have um, some preferred sites on an oceanfront transportation center. So with that, uh, happy to stand by for, with any questions. Thank you, Jim Wood. Well, thank you, <clears throat> Mr. Mayor. And, and I'd like to recognize both, both Ray and, um, and Brian. Ray, Ray's very clearly a major subject matter expert at, at HRT and is a great leader over there and uh, part of William's staff and, and chief of uh, transit operations or, or transit planning. 
And then, then I have to say that uh, that Brian has is, is an outstanding asset for the city in terms of <coughs> transit. Uh, he seems to understand everything about this stuff, and every time I go to an HRT meeting, he'll pass me a note saying you need to look at this and that. And there's there's always a good man. something Thank going on. So so a couple of things I wanted to talk about, if I could, Mr. Mayor, touch on first. Um, e either one of y'all, could you just briefly let the council know about the ridership? within the city in terms of the Route 20, the Oceanfront Route, and the Bayfront Shuttle? So uh, a couple of key statistics uh, in terms of ridership, and I just shared this with members of uh, our commission this afternoon. Uh, the Route 20, which is partially fund it's funded 50-50 more or less by both city of Norfolk and Virginia Beach, carries 1.1 million uh, passengers a, a year. That is our top performing route in the entire 70 route system. So tell them where that goes because... It runs from the oceanfront at Arctic and 19th all the way across Virginia Beach Boulevard down to the DNTC, Downtown Norfolk Transit Center in Downtown Norfolk. To put it in perspective, the tide, the 7.4 mile alignment carries about 1.3 million a year for that 7.3 miles. So it's almost, you know, all the news is always about the tide light rail, but the 20 is an unsung hero in terms of what it carries on a yearly basis. I just thought it was significant to point that out. In terms of overall ridership, we carried uh, last year, fiscal year 17 that ended June 30th as a system, 14.2 million passenger trips. Uh, the Virginia Beach share of that, of the routes that you fund, was about 28% of all that ridership was Virginia Beach related, to put that in context. Is that million, right? an increase? I mean, are those numbers increasing or decreasing? Unfortunately, they're decreasing. This is the third year in a row that ridership is down in not just in this area, but not even in the Commonwealth, but all over the country. There's several theories I could talk about that. But, um, and that's one of the reasons why we're bringing the transit development plan to you. Um, Hillsborough County in the Tampa area, Columbus, Ohio, which won that $50 million Smart Cities grant. Uh, Houston, Texas are revamping their uh, bus systems to more of a high-frequency network to try to be more responsive to the needs of, of transit riders and, and um, potential choice riders. That's so. right, Brian. So uh, just want to talk about financials just for a minute. Um, as as y'all touched on, um, specifically, the, the way transit is funded in Hampton Roads, unfortunately, is, is not an efficient method of, of funding. And um, we, we do have this issue of the state of good repair and the maintenance or, or the replacement of the of the buses. And when Ray mentions an average of 10.5 years, uh, I, I would... And, and, and I would also suggest, because I think it was a Hampton Council, the Newport News Council, Hampton, was it? It was Hampton. Hampton, Hampton Council actually had a meeting on on a bus route in, in Hampton to do that. And I think that would be something that would be very useful for, for us to actually see how it goes. Because when you go to, to Norfolk or to Hampton to, to either one of the, the facilities, you see the vehicles that they've put out that, that are just completely, they can't, they can't use them anymore. And, and and they end up selling these things for three hundred, four hundred dollars right. at auction because there, there's just nothing left to them. And and when you go on and you look on on the road and, and you'll see these buses and you might not notice them, but you may be looking at a 10, 15 year old bus, you know, on in, in some of these different areas. And I think that's 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 an important thing. Um, we had a lot of issues with the true up. We we talked about that last year. Um, they, they've implemented uh, different financial reporting. So, Brian, can you give us a, a quick update on where we are right now in terms of a potential true up for the upcoming year? So, for Virginia Beach, and, and there's on audited numbers, we're looking at about $194,000 credit uh, this year. And a lot of it um, has to do with ridership, too. If, if ridership kind of exceed what was projected over last year that helps with the fare box recovery, um, a state grant also helped with that. So, longer term, um, I'm not sure those credits are sustainable, but we, we do have a management financial advisory committee, including your budget management services and finance, in addition to planning, that are at the table from all the six cities with HRT to help work on long-term sustainable uh, changes to, to help with um, financial management uh, for transit service in our region. So for this year, it is looking like there'll be a credit, and, um, uh, but we'll get the audited numbers later, later on in the year. But the other issue that we heard from the state and I think the way the state described it was a fiscal cliff with, with respect to transit. I don't know if you guys can elaborate on that. I can do that. Um, so the up until now, the state has uh, provided 68% match to any rolling stock purchase or any bus or paratransit vehicle. Uh, 
uh, that goes into revenue service uh, through a bond that they had passed several years ago. That expires in FY 2020, so that's very close to us now. And um, the state matching rate after FY 2020 for the following three years will drop to 49% unless the legislature takes some action to pass some new funding initiative, which is very important to all the transit properties in the state, not just to HRT, because we're all pretty much in the same condition in terms of the state of good repair of our rolling stock. After those three years, it could plummet even more than if they don't take any action, less than 49%. And they're not providing any matching funds for facilities, which also needs to be in a state of good repair, and nothing for technology after FY 2020, because they used to provide 34% for facilities and 18% for technology, and those disappear completely. Um, it's really important in terms of state of good repair because it affects ridership. When your buses are old and break down, if you attracted a choice rider to try it for the first time, they won't come back a second time if they had a bad experience. Um, and even for the dependent riders, it's important to not let them down because they could lose their job. A person on a time clock, I know there's no punch clocks anymore, but someone who has a job that requires them to be on time, yeah. they only give them one or two chances to be late, and after that, they lose their job, and we hear about it. And it's simply because when you have hourly service and one bus is late, you're late for work for over an hour now. Uh, so state of good repair is really a critical issue statewide and in particular for this agency. Given the cost allocation, how we fund capital equipment, it's entirely discretionary dependent on grants, <clears throat> and it's just not enough to replace those buses at a cycle of 25 per year to get the average age debt down. John Earn. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Mayor. And clearly there's a lot of different factors of impact ridership, and I think we've hit on it in terms of the routes and the frequency and the condition of the rolling stock. But one of the things that we've talked about for quite some time, Ray, is uh, adding uh, credit card capacity. Yep. Uh, where, where are we with that project? So that's a good question. Again, that too is dependent on capital and investment. The, uh, we have a sm two, three separate grants that are funding that. Um, it, it's linked very much with things that are invisible to the customers because it's back office improvement on uh, the technology. Uh, but the grants are here, the money is obligated, and we're looking at the both real-time application and mobile fare payment. Next year, through one of the grants we got, we're able to demonstrate, do a pilot program on the VB wave routes with mobile fare payment. Okay. That's what we're anticipating, that we'll be ready to do that. Right. But for the big system, that's a big conversion for all 70 routes, and uh, we still have a few years to go unless an infusion of capital money comes in because the fare box technology has to be upgraded, and that's the big capital investment. The fare boxes we have today cannot accept what you're describing in terms of mobile fare payment. Well, and, I, and I would suspect that you would probably see enough fare box, additional fare box revenues to probably cover a lot of that investment over time. It's, I and mean, we're just in a society where you still, and it's, it's not just having cash, it's having exact money mm -hmm. because you don't get, you don't get money back. So if you got a $50 bill, you got enough money to go, but you're, you know, you're going to pay for a $2 fare and you're going to be out 48 bucks. So, I mean, I think that's going to be a, a big change. And then, and then one last thing, if I could, Mr. Mayor, the, the other thing that I think impacts some of our uh, ridership, not to as great a degree, is just the intensity of the advertising wraps that we have on the buses. And, and I know, for example, uh, the route that runs to the campground at the oceanfront this year has got a, a Tito's vodka wrap uh, that is – I, every time I look at it, I think it's their tour bus because it, there's, you know, the, whatever signage is on there for HRT or the routing to the campgrounds or anything like that is just so muted by it. And so I think it probably would behoove you all to, I mean, we still need the advertising revenue, so I'm not discounting that. But to, in terms of the intensity of the wraps, I think that you guys need to come up with some system that still identifies all of your rolling stock as bus services and HRT. But if you look at that and, and some of the others and, you can't even tell that it's a public bus. We, we can look at how many panels or windows we wrap on a bus. Uh, obviously, we want to generate this revenue because every dollar we can generate out of advertising is a dollar less each of the cities has to contribute. And we, we raise about a million dollars between all the different advertising a year uh, that we do at shelters and, and transit centers on buses. But we can certainly look at our policy and see maybe you don't do a full wrap, you leave the first few windows open. Yeah, I don't, I don't think that you'd see your advertising revenue drop that dramatically if you just identified what is consistent in terms of actually identifying it as an HRT bus. Sure. Okay, we got Rosemary, then Shannon. As the, um, the 
since you replaced the trolleys from the little shuttle buses, mm -hmm. has ridership gone up? Because, I mean, the new trolleys are just fantastic because you can ride outside, you can be in where the air conditioning in, and from my observance, they seem to have a lot of people on them. In fact, my my daughter and grandchildren were down this week, and one of the other to-do lists is they wanted to ride the trolley around and and because uh, they were so excited about it. And, and I will tell you, they said the people operating the trolley were so nice and friendly and polite, and they really commented on the employees. And in actuality, this year, those three rats, well, the two rats of 13 31 did see an increase in ridership from last year. Uh, we didn't do an onboard survey during uh, this year to determine, to ask the question, is it because you have a different vehicle now? But it is, the numbers are higher than last year on the 30 and 31, and I can share that through Brian to bring back the council that's, if you'd like to see great. that. Shannon, and then we'll wind up. Um, I, don't know, I don't recall the route number, but earlier this year, um, the general manager of Winhaven Mall and some of the business associations along the corridor had expressed concerns when we were eliminating the oceanfront to Lynn Haven uh, route. And the reasonable folks, once showing them the numbers, they quickly realized that it didn't financially make sense. Um, I got messages from them today. I just wanted to give you the pass the message along. They're very happy with the progress that you're making, and thank you for working closely sure. with them to to uh, come up with the route that that we've suggested going toward Chesapeake and TCC because it's really going to help them out a lot. Sure, and thank you for your help because we're also talking to them about a parking ride at Lynn Haven as well. So they're excited really about that. And the other question I had. Um, as John brought up the credit card payments, so will there be an official RFP that goes out to select your merchant service provider for when, that? When, when the time comes, it'll be a competitive procurement because gotcha. we're a recipient of federal dollars, so we have to go through that process. But, that the, but they are in the middle year, of it right now for the pilot. For the pilot, pro for the right. wave routes, for the pilot program, there is an RFP out. But when the whole system converts, hopefully when we get the money for all that. Right. It would, again, be another competitive procurement. Gotcha. Okay, thank you. Okay. If I could just Please. tag on, so one of the things that we talked about, and we, I talked to you guys about this yesterday, is is the fact that um, we, we really need to to embrace mobile technology as soon as we can. Um, you know, I was, I was sharing up when I got back from from Europe. I was cleaning out my phone, and I had apps for different European cities transit entities because it was easier just to push on that. And then hop on the bus in Milan and, and do whatever. So, yep. um, you know, that, that, that's that's something that we're way behind on. But again, it goes back to funding. We've we've got to get new buses. We've got to improve the facilities, and we need to upgrade the technology. And all that stuff needs to happen in order to boost ridership. Great point. Thank you all very much for your Thank presentation. You. Appreciate yeah, you coming down to see us. We'll now move on to sustainable water initiative for tomorrow. Swift Thanks. program. Melanie. Uh, sir, um, as Melanie finds her way in the back door, I'd like to recognize the general manager of HRSD, Ted Hennepin. He's here. Thanks for being here, Ted. I appreciate it very much. Jeff, yeah, glad to have you here. And so, uh, Melanie, you know, what would a city council meeting without a discussion about water? So I thought <laughs> we'd just keep that rolling, and today we may change uh, the color of the water a little bit. Right. So, Melanie. Glad to have you. Thank you. Go ahead. Good afternoon, Mayor. Good afternoon, Mayor and members of Council. I'm glad to be with you again. And yes, it's another stormwater topic again today, but a little bit different spin. Um, we're going to be talking about the Chesapeake Bay Pollution Diet and the Sustainable Water Initiative for tomorrow. So I'm going to be explaining how a partnership with HRSD can help to restore the bay and reduce uh, future city cost. So I have a brief presentation on what the Chesapeake Bay Pollution Diet is, uh, what our city requirements are, what SWIFT is, and then how this partnership can be beneficial. So just to go back a little bit, in EPA, EPA in 2010 issued the Chesapeake Bay TMDL, and this is basically a pollution diet uh, to restore clean water in the bay. So the diet restricts the amount of pollutants from the watershed that run off from stormwater. Uh, including nitrogen, phosphorus, and sediment. And this is across the six states and D.C. So as part of that TMDL, EPA required the state to develop a watershed implementation plan uh, to identify how Virginia is going to meet these goals. And the first plan was very preliminary. It was followed by a more detailed plan in 2012. 
And this plan details how the reductions are going to be made throughout the, throughout the state, um, addressing all the discharges that go into the bay. Now, the city did not have any regulatory requirements at this point. Um, it was only until recently, this last year, with our new MS4 permit that was effective July 1st, 2016, that we got the pollutant reduction requirements in our permit. <coughs> So our requirements for pollutant reductions in this new permit are basically a comprehensive briefing that we gave to you back in. It was June 2016, and I believe actually Ted Hennepin presented on the HRSD SWIFT project right before that briefing, and then we did a very long detailed briefing on the MS4 permit. So this is just a quick snapshot from that same slide from that presentation. Uh, the current permit has a Phase 1 Bay TMDL action plan. And that's going to detail the projects that the city is going to implement by 2021 to meet the first part of the diet restrictions, which is 5% of our total reductions that we have to do. So the current permit also includes that we submit a second phase Bay TMDL action plan, and that's due by 2020 with the permit reapplication process. And that's going to identify the projects that we'll construct by 2026. And that's going to meet the additional 35% of the total goal. And then with our next MS4 permit that's issued, because these are five-year permits, it's going to contain the requirements for the final third phase of the Chesapeake Bay Action Plan. So this chart here was in the last presentation also. These are just some planning level estimates for construction of these stormwater management facilities um, based on estimates of the amount of phosphorus and nitrogen and sediment we'd have to remove. And so these will be new, new facility projects and also retrofits of existing facilities. And the cost associated with both the 35% row and the 60% the row for those second and third action plan phases are not included in the current stormwater utility fee increase. Just that 5% is included in the stormwater utility fee increase. Now our first phase action plan is about 60% complete with a submittal due to DEQ next June. And the approach we've taken to meeting our pollutant reductions is really first to identify the most cost-effective retrofit projects like the Kemp's Lake project and the Mill Dam Stream Restoration project that we completed recently. Uh, we're also reviewing all of the construction projects in the city. We can have, um, we can take credit for some of those redevelopment projects. Sometimes they have to reduce an additional 10% or 20% of the existing impervious area. Those also count towards our action plan goals. And another option is to get pollutant credits through nutrient and sediment trading. And there are two state regulations that allow trading for MS4s in Virginia. So this trading framework is really why we're here uh, briefing you today about a partnership. So why partner with HRSD? Uh, HRSD is in a similar situation to ours uh, since they are also regulated for their discharges uh, by the state to reduce pollutants for the Bay TMDL. And EPA already has um, put out recommendations for an integrated planning approach to dealing with these type of things. So basically looking at this type of framework, we need to look at improvement projects on the stormwater side and on the wastewater side to reduce the pollutants going into the bay and then make the most cost effective decisions. So I'll explain more about SWIFT just a little bit on the next slide um, and then we can talk a little bit more about how this uh, trading approach would work. So the Sustainable Water Initiative for tomorrow. HRSD is proposing to construct the SWIFT project and it's going to treat the water to drinking water standards and inject it into the aquifer basically instead of going into the bay. Now I'm not an expert on the SWIFT. Um, so this is a really high level approach on SWIFT, but there are a lot of potential benefits which I've tried to summarize here with the project. So the main focus for today is compliance with the Bay TMDL, which means we're really looking for the excess credits that are going to be generated with the project that can be traded between HRSD and the city to meet our second and third phase Bay TMDL requirements. So based on that slide I showed you previously, this is a potential cost savings to the city of $315 million. Now here's just some timeline for you. SWIFT's not approved or in place yet, but here's the timeline of how we're thinking this might be implemented. So this year, localities will sign the trading agreements with HRSD. Some localities have already entered into agreements. Um, there's still a few more to go. Uh, 
After that, HRSD is going to submit their plan to EPA for approval, and then we'll hear back from them in 2019, hopefully with approval. And the city will need to initiate, after that point, a basically a non-controversial legislative change. We talked about this briefly, but the Lynn Haven and the Little Creek watersheds would need to be moved back into the James River watershed to be eligible for the full trading. Right now, there was the legislature that was passed in 2013 and 2015 that removed those two watersheds from the James River Basin for the Chesapeake Bay TMDL. Uh, swift construction would begin in about 2020. And it's going to take some time to implement because there are several plants that this has to be constructed at. So SWIFT, um, basically going in 2026, going back to kind of the city's plan, we have to submit our next second phase action plan um, for that 2026 deadline. And the 35% goal has to be addressed in that plan. And HRSD would be able to provide those pollutant reduction credits that we need for compliance temporarily until SWIFT is fully implemented, which would be in the early 2030s. And HRSD will also provide the pollutant reduction credits that we need for the third phase reductions following that. And then they will convert to permanent credits following the completion of the project. I just wanted to highlight briefly some of the things that SWIFT does not address. So some of the things are we need to meet our first phase pollutant reduction. So that 5% goal, we need to do that ourselves. Uh, and we have projects underway now working towards meeting that goal. We also have local TMDL requirements for bacteria and phosphorus. So these TMDLs are a result of the DEQ's water quality monitoring. And we have 18 impaired waterways in the city. And DEQ has issued seven local TMDLs that we still have to address. So we'll be implementing projects and programs to address those. We're also required by the permit to construct five retrofit projects throughout the city to improve water quality. And then there are some other numerous requirements associated with our MS4 permit uh, related to stormwater infrastructure, monitoring, inspections that were the subject of that previous briefing that I mentioned. And finally, the credits from HRSD cannot be used for our public projects that we construct, like our roadway projects and they can't be used for private development projects. They can only be used for that Chesapeake Bay TMDL component of the MS4 permit. So in summary, uh, potential cost savings to the city, 315 million or maybe more. We, these are just planning level estimates at this point. Uh, SWIFT will meet the compliance needs of all of the Hampton Roads localities. Uh, SWIFT will also reduce the rate of land subsidence in Virginia Beach, which is a big deal for us. Uh, SWIFT does not address our local TMDLs and our permit requirements. And the city and HRSD both have a goal of clean, clean water, sustainable lakes, rivers, and estuaries. And I have, um, I invited Ted Hennepin, the general manager with HRSD, to join us today, just so that if you have any questions about SWIFT, and I'll be happy to answer any questions about the partnership. Great. Thank you. Any questions or comments? Just Great. tell him he's a hero. <laughs> yes, thank you, Ted. <laughs> uh, this is only dealing with the Chesapeake Bay watershed. Yes, ma'am. You say you've got 18 impaired local waterways in Virginia Beach. You mean just in the Chesapeake Bay, or is that it everywhere? That's everywhere. Okay. So there's 18 impaired waterways throughout the city, and those are the local TMDLs. There's seven local TMDLs that have been addressed. The majority of them are bacteria-related. Right. Um, there is also a phosphorus... TMDL, and that's in the North Landing watershed. So you're including the southern watersheds? They have to be handled separately. They would not be eligible for these right. credits. Okay. Mm -hmm. So they would be addressed with the fee increase that we just did. Very good presentation. Thank you very much. We'll move on. And, sir, you, sir. that is the simplest, most professional <laughs> ever lay down that saved us $315 million. And I want to thank Ted thank for you, it. Ted. Right. And, well, and we don't know whether it works or not. Though. Well, um, <laughs> you know, it's going to be potable, potable, and Ted and I are going to drink that water, aren't we? Ted? <laughs> so I, I felt my uh, lot raising up. You felt that <laughs> surge. <laughs> You're pretty high up there. Pressure going down. Um, so um, 
Are you blood pressure going? Um, I got DSC. So thanks a lot. And from one from one professional to another, uh, I've got uh, Nancy McIntyre here. As you know, she's our development services administrator, and a lot of things have been going on, from a survey to changing the way we do business. And I just thought it's important that uh, we get her in here to reassure the council we continue to keep our finger on the pulse about working to get to yes. And that's the title of her briefing. So. Nancy, we're glad to have you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor and council members. We're really happy to be here today to um, provide you an update on the uh, Planning and Community Development Development Services Center progress in site plan uh, approvals. Our main goal, as uh, Mr. Hansen mentioned, is we are wanting to get to yes. Uh, we want projects to proceed quickly and through our required compliance reviews so that construction can get underway. And I do want to assure you that staff involved in um, the review process is well aware of the importance that we have on uh, and the effect we have on our economic vitality. So over the rec uh, over recent years, we've had a number of comments and complaints about our review processes. Uh, generally speaking, it's been too difficult, too slow, the requirements are not clear, and staff is too opinionated and not staying within established uh, minimum requirements of our city codes and policies. And um, so those have been the main complaints, and we've, we've received uh, comments, feedback from the Process Improvement Steering Committee. The um, auditors uh, did a report, and also the development community through group meetings and uh, individual input. Um, we've also reached out to all the review staff, and this includes uh, 35 different departments or divisions and approximately 75 staff members. So improvements we've made to date, um, I'm going to talk about a few of them here, and then we'll go into a little bit more detail on some of the others in uh, more slides. But some of them, the ones that we've done uh, real quickly, we've reduced the number of agencies that are involved in most of our reviews. And with that, um, that has reduced the number of redundant comments, uh, which were a problem. We've met with each of the review agencies to better identify their roles and responsibilities um, in the review. And we've created a single family uh, checklist, which is now in a spreadsheet format um, that staff is required to use. And that spreadsheet has the specific minimum requirements that you have to have, and so we're, we're not deviating from that spreadsheet when we do single-family reviews. Uh, we also are running weekly reports. Uh, this is helping the, to keep the staff accountable. Uh, it shows their deadlines and whether or not they're late. Um, and we've also created the new Development Liaison Office which we'll cover uh, later in the presentation. We have, for about a year and a half, two years, we've been having uh, formalized pre-submittal meetings. So we always had meetings before, but now we've, we've made them much easier to understand and everyone attends. Uh, these, we've set aside Thursdays for, for project meetings. All of the review staffs required to attend most meetings and the developers and their design teams both attend so that they receive all the information they ask for and we provide them with standard information. We use a standard draft agenda. It covers processes as well as technical requirements. Uh, we share that information uh, by email and we also save it in a cella, which I'll talk about a little bit. Um, these meetings have really helped us. It's helped staff understand the developer side of the story. And the developers can come in with their team. They explain their process. They tell us what their needs are. They tell us what their time frames are. And so this is really important because now instead of just getting a piece of paper on a desk and looking at a drawing, staff has a one-on-one -on -one to have a better understanding of the effect of what their review is um, on these developments. So it's, it, this has been a very important process and learning piece for the city staff. And it's also um, a way that the staff can work out conflicts, because we do have conflicts. I mean, sometimes entrances need to go the same place a fire hydrant needs to go. We have to work that out, and we want to do that. It gives us a chance to do that ahead of time instead of waiting through a review process and finding out we have a problem that is an internal problem that we need to fix. So we're working together, uh, together better as a team and teaming with the developer and their design team. So the, the pre-submittal meetings are doing uh, very well. We've gotten a, quite a good, uh, quite a good uh, feedback on that. So last year we had 210 meetings, and we're now averaging about 20 meetings per month. 
Uh, we also have comment review meetings. So in addition to pre-submittal, uh, pre-design meetings, uh, after we've gone through review, this is an opportunity for staff and the consultants and the developers to meet, talk about the review. A lot of times, uh, either the comments aren't clear or the plans aren't very clear. It gives us a chance to work those issues out. Um, anyone can ask for a meeting at any time. And uh, we try to help them understand the technical criteria that we're held to uh, through our codes and policies so that they can help meet those uh, and help us get to approval. Um, all of these meetings are objective with both the pre-submittals and the comment review meetings is to reduce the number of review cycles and get to, be, uh, get to approval and get under construction as quickly as possible. Acela automation is um, a big deal for us. <clears throat> we, we went live with this um, software in October of 2015. It allows for electronic submission of all applications. It tracks the workflow pro progress, and it's also used to store data. And most importantly, or one piece that's very important, is it's also a communication portal. Uh, it allows us to create a variety of reports that help manage the workload and help hold staff accountable for meeting their deadlines. And it's used by the consultants. They can actually track the review um, from their own offices, and they know who's reviewing the plans as well. They can see the, the reviewers' names. Um, it's also required that all the city staff involved in review actually use a CELA. They, there's no paper movement back and forth between offices anymore. Everything's in a CELA. Um, the project team leader knows when the reviewers are, have completed, and so do the consultants. So they know when they've got to get their letters done. A CELA also handles permitting, sureties, and inspection processes as well as the review process. <clears throat> so we've got we've configured a number of reports <clears throat> in Acela. Um, some of them are rather minor; they're just for tracking purposes internally. Um, others we we have weekly reports now that we generate. Uh, we send to staff so they can see what's under review and what their due dates are and whether they're late. Uh, we also have some larger reports that include all the submittals that we've had, um, site plan approvals, and permits. And we're we're continuing to. Um, to work on the reports to improve them um, and actually create new reports as the needs are identified. So in fiscal year 17, uh, we had around 3,000 submittals to the DSC, <clears throat> and this is a break up here. Um, about 45% are site plan submittals, and those would include multiple submittals on the same project, but they also include all single family, multifamily, and commercial projects. Subdivision construction plans actually account for less than 2% of our submittals, and these are generally the uh, plans that involve new streets. And then over 30% of our submittals are subdivision plats and legal documents, which are typically associated with development projects. About 3.5% um, are as-built surveys. Now, it, what's important about this is under the new stormwater rules, um, we're required to have as-built surveys done on all stormwater facilities. So all of those have to come through a review. And approximately 9% of our, our uh, submittals are actually preliminary requests for help in the Chesapeake Bay Preservation Area. Um, those are over-the-counter. They're informal. It helps the uh, citizens usually... Um, understand what process, if any, they need to go through to, to do a project in the resource protection area. Um, in fiscal year 17, we, in, we actually approved almost 400 site plans. Now, this is the only s approval uh, report we can achieve yet from Acela. We're working on others. But, um, but this one really gave us a great, uh, a great picture. So 60% of our uh, of our approvals are actually individual single-family homes. 70%, including those single-family homes, are residential, so single-family, duplex, and multifamily. And then about 17% are commercial, office, and industrial projects, and that also includes schools and city facilities. And our permits issued um, in 2000, or fiscal year 17, uh, we issued 275 permits in the DSC. Um, two of those were hauling permits. We're seeing more of those because they're associated with dredge projects. 150 land disturbing 
permits and 123 right-of-way permits. This report, um, these reports come out as an Acela spreadsheet. So we anticipate putting this particular one on open data here very soon. And uh, we're working with the STIR office and IT to get that to work. And uh, at this point, I'd like to introduce Carrie Bookholt, our new development liaison coordinator. And Carrie's going to finish up the presentation. We welcome you. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks, Nancy. I'm going to give you just a quick overview of the development liaison office and what our role is here in the city of Virginia Beach. So the establishment of liaison offices is a popular trend throughout the region and nationally. Um, and we provide a service to the development community. When you are assigned, you're assigned to the development liaison office, you're assigned to one of our team members. We're currently housed within the director's office in planning. Um, we're a team member, um, we're a team of two. So Tatiana Meyer here on the computer, she's our other development liaison. We have a diverse background in the development industry. Mine stems from landscape architecture and planning and Tatiana is in engineering research and planning. So our office leads the coordination and the oversight on complex projects such as the arena, Wegmans at Town Center, and the future Price Street apartment development that will be coming soon. We also provide an essential development concierge type service to those that developers that are new to the area or businesses that are new to our market or to homeowners that aren't familiar with our processes to nonprofits that aren't familiar with our process. Um, so we can work on a project that's complex or something that's very simple that might not even need a formal DSC site plan review. Our office is also undertaking a variety of special projects for the department, such as our process improvement initiatives, process documentation and reporting, and the updating of the department's website. So to conclude the presentation, we'll talk about some of the ongoing initiatives for the entire department. We have an active customer satisfaction survey that's available to our customers both online or via hard copy at our counters. And I think that you got, in your recent Friday package, you had a snapshot of all the feedback we've received to date. Everything we've received so far has been very positive. As Nancy mentioned, we are working on our um, Acela reports to get those into the open data portal. We are working with our review agencies to formulate checklists, not just for the single family plans, but for all the different types of plan review so that it'll be clear to our developers what's required, what specific items are required on those plans to get to approval so we can get them to yes sooner. The Development Liaison Office is mapping out our current processes using flowcharts and analyzing the data that we're pulling out of our Acela reports. And we're also researching and identifying some industry best practices for review and permitting. Our department, like I mentioned, is slated for a website update. So we'll put all of this process documentation and checklists on our website for our customers to use. So all of our initiatives are in line with the feedback we've gained from the Process Improvement Steering Committee, from the um, City Auditor's Report, and the meetings that we've had with our customers. And it supports our department's goal to provide better communication and transparency with the development review process. So that wraps up our report, and we'll take any questions you have. Thank you, Jim Wood. Thanks. Um, list. Um, how often are you hitting these two dates? How often? So we, it changes weekly. We run a, week, a Friday report, and it can be anywhere from 10% to 20% of the things that are in review may be late on that particular day. There's a variety of reasons for that. We have everything from, we have staff out, and not every agency's got multiple people um, that review. So if someone's out, they may be running late, which pushes our dates. Um, in addition, we try to work with the consultants and the developers. So we do have people that call and say, let us, just don't, don't log it out yet. Let us fix that with a red line, and we'll get it back in. So we'll hold off. It looks bad on our part that we're not meeting that deadline, but in fact, there's another reason why we're not. And 80 to 90 percent of the time they're on time? Yes. Mm -hmm. And then, and I'd shared with, um, I guess about a year ago, with um, then Deputy City Manager Doug Smith uh, about the issue that where I had three different uh, PEs, and I gave Doug the names and phone numbers of all of them to, to talk to them who refused to do 
work in Virginia Beach um, on single family homes because of the issues. I've talked to two of them. They both still won't do it. One of them sent me a list of issues that, that he had. Um, one of the big ones is he says, apparently we are the only locality that has a very egregious uh, 13 boilerplates for stormwater maintenance facility agreements that other localities don't use. And that because of that, they have to go through, check them, and then record them and do all this. And they say it just adds time and, and, and hassle to them. So that might be something that you'd want you'd to check on. Um, as far as I know, the third one is now back doing work in Virginia Beach. We do not require a, a stormwater maintenance agreement for single family. I'm, I'm sorry, it's just general, in general, stormwater uh, maintenance storm water facility. Yeah. stuff. Yes, we, uh, there's like, um, I can give you this. It sent me a, a list of oh, all the ones that you all require. And it may be they're not, he may not be familiar with our latest checklist because we scaled way back on our review of stormwater. We are only looking at lot grading at this time. Great, thank you. Bobby Dyer, then Shane. Yeah, thank you. And I want to thank you and uh, Barry for, you know, and uh, the city manager for, you know, really taking this initiative on. Process Improvement Task Force took a serious look at this for a number of reasons. I think we're moving in the right direction. Still got a ways to go, but, you know, it's always good to be moving in the right direction. And uh, the three people that were on process that were really influential in getting the report done were Tuck Bowie. Uh, you know, former president of uh, you know the Home Builders Association, Bob Scott, a uh, former city planner, and you know Brad Martin, a license professional engineer, helped do it. And the idea wasn't to be critical; it was to be helpful, and you know, really identify some of the problems and uh, perceptions, you know, that were out there to make things uh, uh, move better. And I think the point being, though, and I think you hit on it, it's essential that we continue to improve because we got to get businesses and homes open, get them on the tax rolls a lot quicker, get people employed a lot quicker and everything else. So, you know, that's kind of mission essential about which what direction we're going to be going in this stuff. But I applaud you for your efforts, you know, so far and wish you luck as you continue to move forward and, you know, like, you know, Larry the Cable guy said, get it done. Thank you. Thanks. Jane. I pass. I'm good. Great. Uh, Dave, you got the broadband. It's pretty important, but we need a solid hour for closed session, and we haven't done the agenda and all. What do you want to do? I'm going to do broadband. We're good to go. Thanks very much. You got I think you're doing great. <laughs> <laughs> so eat. Somebody just email me that. So. Got four and a half now. <laughs> Be right here. Oh, I need your clicker and we're going to roll. Come on, guys. Yeah, we're rolling. All right. All right, Mayor, members of Council. Uh, following Hampton Roads Transportation Advisory Committee's decision to fund the regional transportation needs and with the arrival of transoceanic fiber connections to, to Europe and South America, it is now time to implement a regional broadband strategy to continue developing Hampton Roads as a nationally connected 21st century community and international gateway. And I use that as a lead in because we have for a long time uh, tried to figure out a way that we could continue or we could make a major uh, uh, input into the regionalization, the growth of the regionalization of our, uh, of our Hampton Roads region. And so, uh, you all are aware that I meet monthly with all the chief administration officers of the other 16 jurisdictions of the Hampton Roads MSA. And uh, we have for well over a year contemplated uh, what would be the opportunities to continue uh, becoming connected and to leverage uh, the investment that we are seeing emerge in the world of fiber and, um, and internet connectivity. And so we uh, decided that we uh, would uh, have our CIOs of our various uh, jurisdictions uh, form a task force and start to work together collaboratively to take a look at how we might be able to advance uh, connectivity. And so they have been meeting for well over a year at uh, various times and established the three uh, task force goals that you see before you uh, to uh, leverage uh, the fiber infrastructure, both 
what we individually as jurisdictions are installing in the ground, uh, but also to take a look at what this transoceanic uh, advancement is going to provide to us to strengthen collaboration and engagement with higher education. Uh, we know that uh, ODU has uh, successfully connected their main campus with 100 gigs uh, on, on all educational, higher educational uh, network uh, so that uh, research and development can, uh, can grow exponentially uh, in those institutions. And then to leverage regional fiber connectivity to attract new businesses and create 21st century jobs. And uh, the immediate outcome is to conduct an assessment and prepare an app application for a Go Virginia grant to construct a south side fiber loop. And I will be addressing that today. Uh, as you know, we formed a, um, a broadband task force. Uh, you know that uh, Councilman Ben Davenport represented you on that, and uh, uh, school board member Joel McDonald represented the school, and we had CIOs from uh, ODU, and, uh, and we had our CIOs from both schools and, uh, and the city, as well as uh, professional leaders on that, and I assisted uh, the two uh, elected officials in providing uh, some uh, education and some guidance, and then we determined that we wanted to create here in Virginia Beach a middle mile strategy, one that would not take the place of the private internet service providers, but one that would be able to invest in fiber to take advantage of our intelligent transportation system as well as the fiber that the school system had put in place, and be able to expand our connectivity to enlarge our, our bandwidth to our libraries, to our police precincts, to our fire stations, because the demand for data, the demand for video, the demand for connectivity uh, mandated that we do so. T1 cat, uh, uh, cable connections from uh, Cox Communications were not going to survive, we're not going to provide the bandwidth we needed and the cost to provide the 1G or better at those various locations was going to be way cost prohibitive. So an analysis was done and we moved into the fiber arena and we did that with a budget that was well over five years and as we sit here today, your gap fiber infill is ongoing to, to the various uh, 66 satellite locations of our government facilities located throughout the city. And so what we did was we presented that to, uh, to the CAOs and said, there's a great opportunity for us to create a middle mile strategy across the region, to take advantage of the transoceanic cable landing and to be able to expand that which we learned in Virginia Beach to our sister cities, especially here on the south side. And so you can see the opportunity to have shared services, to enhance the public safety mission, to give greater fidelity and interoperability, and to probably reduce costs associated with each of the jurisdictions by, by growing our, uh, our shared uh, uh, communications network in the public safety arena. Uh, but mostly, uh, today's presentation about uh, creating a regional broadband strategy is that second major bullet, and it is about the economic development. It is to foster an ecosystem for low-interest service providers to meet the demand of affordable Internet to address business digital divide. It, it attracts new enterprises with high-paying jobs in our region, as it is doing in many other regions across the nation and it will support business incubators, technology innovators, product accelerators, and data centers, and I'm very proud of that line. I personally wrote that. Uh, but you got to understand what an incubator is, an innovator is, and what an accelerator is. And it's a unique uh, emergence of 21st century jobs that uh, the bottom line uh, of that is to retain our children, our grandchildren that are getting educated, and to bring in new jobs so that they will stay here and be the workforce that will work in those new 21st century uh, businesses. Not to mention the, the whole business with regards to, to educational research. Uh, I think this is pretty important. Here's your, here's your June bill, uh, City Council. This is what we're paying to have dedicated 1G from Cox to our data center, $4,500 a month. This is our dedicated bill uh, from Verizon for 400 megabytes of internet backup to our data center at $7,300 per month. 
in the cities that are actually implementing broadband networks, these are the costs for 1G, 80 bucks. 1G in Austin, Texas, 80 bucks. Salisbury, North Carolina, 1G, $105. And here's what we are paying inside Hampton Roads. For 200 megabytes and small business, 244, and for 100 megabytes residential, $76. And you can see what the Verizon costs are. Clearly, we do not have an affordable internet connectivity strategy here in Virginia Beach. Oops. Okay. So. It's not high speed they, they internet, like, That's it's scary, like that. man. That's scary. I'm there. I'm not lying. I'm not lying. Uh, so. Um, it's cock sabotage. So what, so what are the regional opportunities? We have an ability to uh, attract new businesses just by being a connected region. We're able to produce the ability uh, to entice new uh New uh, to leverage both our, our fiber that we have in the ground, but also to entice new businesses to look at us for the right reasons. That is, we have invested in the infrastructure necessary to provide them, just as manufacturing requires water and electricity, 21st century jobs require bandwidth, and they require that connectivity so that they can invest in the city. Um, the only way we're going to make that work, the only way I'm going to convince you as an elected body and convince the elected bodies of all the other jurisdictions is to figure out how to find grants that will promote that loop so that each of those jurisdictions have an ability to build off that loop to connect their government facilities and to have the dark fiber necessary to entice businesses to come in because there will be the bandwidth necessary for them to invest. And so where is this happening? Let me show you where it's happening. So Edward, please bring that up right now. Go right to the video because we are on time. But um, while that's buffering up, I want to thank uh, uh, our councilman, Ben Davenport. They are bringing this team in to our, uh, to our city. They're going to be at the Slover Library. And this is their website. Pop it on right away. We're going to spend about four plus minutes looking at this because, quite frankly, you got four. I understand that, <laughs> Mayor. But this is what's going on in a city that's very similar. The city's very similar to ours, with the university's very similar to ours. I'm Tracy Fusey, chair of the North Carolina Next Generation Networks. It's been a privilege to be part of an organization that has helped to bring high-speed networking to our region, including both businesses and residences. We're glad you can take a couple minutes with us today to hear a little bit more about what we've done and how this technology and the public-private collaboration we forged through it is helping to change North Carolina. The mission of NC Engine is economic development and helping uh, underserved communities. Four of the universities, Wake Forest, Duke, Chapel Hill, and NC State, got together to try and seed the, the development of fiber optic to the home and to the business. We needed to work with the municipalities for economic development. So it was Winston-Salem, Durham, Chapel Hill, Raleigh, Carborough, and Cary. We wanted two things. We wanted fiber so that we could move to the next generation of infrastructure. But the most important reason we wanted it was to make sure everybody was connected, kind of level the playing field so people could all compete. If you can get a service that's 10 to 15 times faster than what you have right now for the same price for members of your community, why wouldn't you take the time and initiative to try to work toward that? We want the cost so low and the bandwidth so high that you don't even worry about it and you do anything you want to with that connection. The North Carolina Next Generation Network will allow Chapel Hill to expand opportunities for education and research as well as drive job creation and economic growth. High-speed broadband is really the next piece of an infrastructure that all cities are looking for. Thank you for calling Ceiling 311. This is Rhonda. How may I assist you? It offers other opportunities for us as a city government with the exchange of information among city departments and I think the enhanced public safety applications of this as our police and firefighters and others being able to use this really rapid uh, data transfer and we're delighted that, uh, that we're, we are a part of that. 
So through our RFP, we ended up selecting AT&T. They had a fabulous package, hit everything that we request in our wish list. Okay. Fiber has come now on the heels of I wanted you to see how the cities are combining with the academic institutions to create the infrastructure that it takes to attract 21st century jobs. So how are we going to do this? We are conducting a pre-engineering study. We took $85,000 of our next generation network CIP, and we have invested in an assessment of how we come out of Virginia Beach, how we connect to the TCC centers and the VMAS in Suffolk, and a white paper that will break down lessons learned in the National Capital Region and in the Raleigh-Durham area and other cities that have made this investment to determine the number of 21st century jobs and the investments that private capital is making to take advantage of this connectivity. We are going to do it with four phases because the grant monies that we're pursuing is limited. And we're going to begin with a south side fiber infrastructure, move to a peninsula, move to south side, and then grab the outline, and, and here's how it's going to work. As you know, there are, as I told you, there are 17 jurisdictions in all of Hampton Roads. These are your 17 districts. So let's look at phase one. Phase one concerns the big five of the south side. That would be Chesapeake, that would be Portsmouth, Norfolk, Suffolk, and Virginia Beach. So take a look. The CIOs have mapped all the infrastructure, the fiber infrastructure that's been currently put in the ground by the various cities. And so if you blow that up and you look at a potential to create a loop that connects the TCCs and VMAS, you have the capacity in a very large fiber in uh, construction uh, inlaid to be able to connect each of the jurisdictions to allow them to use the dark fiber in there and also to provide the, the sufficient dark fiber to create a middle mile. We don't become internet service providers. We allow businesses to talk to an internet service provider to, to allow them to lease fiber like we did here in the city of Virginia Beach for, for Lumos and then connect to their businesses so that they have the broadband that they want. So here you have uh, phase one completed and now we're focusing on phase two which is up in the peninsula and you can see the fiber that has been invested there. And so they will in year 2018 uh, follow up with phase two to create their loop and once their loop is in place we'll move to phase three which is the the connection and the redundancy of connecting on the two uh, bridge tunnels between Hampton Roads Bridge Tunnel and Monitor Merrimack so that you have a fully connected uh, north side south side and then we'll move into phase four where we push fiber into our outlying counties so that they have the backbone to move forward with what is called a Wi-Fi solution. So what is Wi-Fi? Wi-Fi is uh, an opportunity for us to attack the digital divide in our regional areas and also in areas where people can't afford to have that. And in doing so, you have the ability to eliminate the homework gap, but more importantly, you create the accessibility and affordability of broadband. And, uh, and Mr. Uh, Davenport is working with a uh, current organization. Uh, there are many Wi-Fi companies out there. I'm not saying this is the best, but they have come into our region and say, hey, we're looking to put a pilot in place, and we, the city, are looking to solve some of our uh, Wi-Fi responsibilities. And here are their costs, and I'm not going to make a comment with regard to their costs, but let me tell you, $9.25 to get 25 megabytes will solve the digital divide in families that can't otherwise afford it. So what am I talking about? We have a nexus to put a fiber line down Princess Anne across Pungo Ferry and tie it into our fire station right here. We have a public nexus. There's no profit in that. We have a public safety nexus to do that. There's a tower there. As I showed you on uh, 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 Wildfire uh, 5G, they have an eight mile radius transmitter that would provide capability for 1,500 homes to connect down in the county for a cost that is a fraction of anything that they're having to pay right now to have an ability. And so what might that look like in all the rural areas of our Hampton Roads MSA? It would look about like this. In a very short period of time, provided you invest in a fiber backbone, a broadband strategy for your entire region, you'll have an ability to put a coverage in there in each of the jurisdictions to work Wi-Fi solutions to help them. And so what we're doing is 
We are uh, moving forward with our white paper, and we have a very tight timeline to accomplish that. And though there are quantifiable government benefits for each jurisdiction to implement a broadband strategy, the significant outcome resides in the creation of high-paying jobs in 21st century companies. And if you go to our Hampton Roads Economic Development Alliance's uh, chart of what are those focus sectors, every one of those sectors have to have some connectivity with it. And we're taking a look at what are the specific jobs that will be created, where has it been done before, and what is it going to turn around for us to be competitive in America. And so here's how we're going to pursue this, the funding strategy. We're going to pursue a Go Virginia grant. It requires a collaboration between two or more localities. It requires a collaboration with higher education, potential to create high-paying jobs, and promotes innovation. I would tell you all four of those are a check if you move forward with a broadband strategy for our region. But take a look at this timeline, council members. They want that application by 31 October. And the regional council review will make a decision on 15 November, and the state board will make their December allocation in this. By, before the end of the year. And so we are pursuing a Go Virginia request to construct the main Southside Fiber Loop. And so what I'm asking of you today is, will you endorse participation in a broadband initiative? It's not a commitment of money, it's not a commitment of anything but our time to continue to work specifically with the other four large cities on the South Side to try and see if we have, with our assessment, we have a workable solution at a reasonable cost that we can pursue a Go Virginia grant. Uh, authorized me to prepare a PDC brief, not quite as fast as this, but <laughs> one that would be understandable and with the commitment of the other four cities, city managers to be a part of that, and then to collaborate with the PDC for a Go Virginia grant. Subject to your questions. Census, or do you need a vote? I just need head nods. I think it just well, Council, I'm sorry this got rushed because I really would like to have understood it better than I do right now. Fortunately, I've been briefed on this previously with Ben. I think this is something great for our city. Barbara, this is something that I think is extremely exciting for the southern part of the city. And then for you think about the opportunities for economic development, et cetera, I would hope we could support this. But I would like maybe another presentation when we're not rushed, because this is good stuff and important stuff, and Very important. it shouldn't have been rushed like this. Okay, everybody okay? Go for it. All right, let's go to the agenda, please. All right, there are ordinances and resolutions. Uh, I, I will need to, uh, or would like to add a resolution uh, today. It actually uh, is related to the hospice application. Uh, if you noticed, if you read the transcript, the neighbors are very concerned about making sure there is an ongoing uh, buffer, particularly in that residual parcel that will be retained by the city. And uh, this resolution simply says, uh, that it's the desire of City Council that the buffer of live oaks on the adjacent parcel be maintained and replaced by the city while the property is owned by the city and to ensure that the buffer is maintained when and if the property is sold to any other entity for any purpose. We have been working with uh, Frank Fentress for and the neighborhood has for, for some time to have those live oaks there and this just assures them that we're going to continue that relationship. So that but would become item number eight. You'll have to make a motion to have it added on when we go out there, right. please. Okay. Can you stop so it? We will, um, All right. Mr. Mayor, or Mr. Vice Mayor, can I just get an explanation on number one? What I, I couldn't really understand what they opted to do. They get rid of the temporary transfer station. Did that save them the money? I, I'm, sure I'm, I'm sure I'm fine with it. I just didn't understand it and couldn't figure it out from reading. The Bayville Creek one? Correct. Okay. I'm sorry. Yeah, number one. What do they opt to do? That is the primary cost well, savings. We, 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 but we didn't get rid of anything. Yeah, what they did Creek. is we deleted those costs from their participation. Well, how are they going to transfer the sediment if they don't have a transfer station? The work's been done. This is an after the fact, the first four year adjustment to the SSD that came. Uh, we put the full levy costs of the first dredging of the transfer station that we had to build on the private property and the special service Derek uh, uh, 
transferred uh, peer that was necessary to do that. When we agreed to this, uh, this, uh, this SSD, we did not have a Lesnar Bridge project. We did not have uh, the have taken away the Lynn Haven uh, transfer station that we had there, the Lynn Haven uh, boat ramp ability to do there. So we added about $163,000 in additional mud moving and additional construction associated to provide that. So we built that project with a commitment to, um, uh, we built that project estimate with a commitment to transfer to the Crab Creek and the Lynn Haven boat ramp. We couldn't do that, and they would have been delayed four-plus years as we built the Lesnar Bridge. Instead, we went on and built that transfer station. I put it on them for the recalculation when, in fact, we had a nexus to do some uh, dredging, both to connect to our uh, Western Branch channel, but also to complete the project and move out in the timeline necessary. To spread the cost of the temporary transfer station to other, through projects that benefited from it, other Cor than the one. Is that right. right, and that's exactly how we're going to, gonna, and that's exactly how we're going to pay for it. Yes, sir. Lewis is fine with it. Okay. All right, everything's going to be on consent under ordinances. If you'll name on item number two, I'll be abstaining. Oh, you're not pulling City View? I'm sorry. Are we pull, do are we, we have not, speakers? I imagine we do. Okay, we'll be pulling it. Okay, everything else okay, folks? I'm going to be voting no on 7A. On what? On holiday lights. That's a good one. No. We'll now go to planning. Okay. Uh, under planning, uh, real estate investment, associates, uh, read down, bayside. I have no problem with that. I'll be abstaining. Okay. Item two, James Gruseka and Mona Avenue and Associates uh, Beach District. No John. issues. No issues, Mr. Vice Mayor. Consent, please. Item three, the attorney has asked for a deferral. Uh, how long is this? You can ask for any specific time, so we'll just say indefinitely. To, and just say indefinitely. We had to revise the disclosure statement on this one because it seems that the town bank is. Okay, I'll be, defer, I'll be abstaining on that. So, there you go. Thanks. All right. Item four Mogul Properties, Kempsville, Jessica. All good. Item five Bickford of Virginia Beach, Larry B. Slopel, Princess Anne Road. So forth, uh, Barbara. Okay. That was a very good, did you hear? Yeah. Very good. <laughs> I'm buying a lot of it. <laughs> Hospice House of Sampton, Southampton Rose, number six, Princess Anne. There may be speakers, uh, but you can go by that. Um, if there are, we'll have to pull it. But uh, with that resolution that I passed, I would recommend approval. Otherwise, you're okay. Yes, yeah, that's right. All right. Item seven, Mermaid Winery, Bayside. I'm fine with it. Item eight, Milligros, Montessa, and Beach Holdings, Kempsville, Jessica. All good. Okay. Council, I'm going to bypass comments unless there's an emergency comment. No emergency, Mr. Mayor, but we did. I did go to the Wave Warriors thing today. Oh, wow, right. so that's so, nice. So, we had 600 time? Warriors that we did, and they presented this uh, to, wow. to the that's council. Wonderful. They, they keep going with a bigger one, I guess, it's to cover the asbestos here. But if we can wow. <laughs> find a spot to hang it, that'd be great. All well, you had to do was jump I'd out love to find a spot. Okay. The, the chair will entertain a motion to recess into a closed that's session pursuant that. to the exemptions from open meetings allowed by Section 2.2-37118, Code of Virginia, is amended for the following purposes. Publicly held property discussion or consideration of the acquisition of real property for public purpose or the disposition of publicly held property where discussion in an open meeting would adversely affect the bargaining position or negotiating strategy of the public body pursuant to section 2.2-37118A3 Lynn Haven District. Legal matters consultation with legal counsel and briefings by staff members or consultants pertaining to actual or probable litigation where such consult consultation or briefing in an open meeting would adversely affect the negotiating or litigating posture of the public body and consultation with legal counsel employed or retained by a public body regarding specific legal matters requiring the provision of legal advice by such counsel pursuant to section 2.2-3711A7 Arena Project, Sherwood Lakes Asheville Park. 
personnel matters, discussion, consideration, or interviews prospective candidates for employment, assignment, appointment, promotion, performance, demotion, salaries, disciplining, or resignation of specific public officers, appointees, or employees by any public body pursuant to Section 2.2-3711A1, Council appointments, Council um, boards, commissions, committees, authorities, agencies, and appointees. Do I have a motion? So moved. Second. Call the roll, please. Mrs. Abbott. Here. Mr. Davenport. Aye. Mrs. Dyer. Aye. 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 Aye.